Welcome to On the Bubble Podcast, episode 34. I'm your host, Sebastian Deweda. It's with me, my co-host, Yukili Bender. Today, we're going to be doing an episode on how to draft assassins, so Azuri and Arachne. As always, before we go into that, how was your week, Yuki? My week's been good. Sort of the last scramble before Pro Tour Baltimore. We're, rec- we're recording Tuesday night around 9 p.m., and I leave at 6.30 a.m. in the morning as my flight time, so I need to get to the airport at 4.30 a.m. Yeah, so really running out of time at this point. But um, but yeah, just kind of hammering everything down. Feeling pretty good overall. I think at this point I'm locked on Lexi, just trying to figure out, figure out kind of like the last few sideboard slots and sideboard plans. But for the most part, the list is solidified and it's just swapping a few cards here and there kind of thing. Out of 10, how prepared are you for the classic constructor portion of the uh, Pro Tour? I'm not really sure. Um, I think that this format's hard. It seems like there's a lot of different decks that are good. Like I think that Lexi, Oldham, and Dromai are all pretty strong right now. And there's like other playable decks as well. And there's a variety of different builds for each of them. And just accounting for everything is, I don't know if it's possible. And trying to account for as much as you can is really tough. So I'd say overall, I'm pretty prepared like i've been on this deck since outsiders came out i feel like i understand it i know all the lines i have a ton of experience on it it's just you know you always wonder if you can do something slightly better there's there's definitely an element of that but but overall i think this is maybe like one of the events i feel the most prepared for and just having your your pet deck be arguably one of the best decks in the format i think is um a pretty good place to be so yeah that's definitely upside being able to be comfortable with the deck you want to play and uh what about draft or how prepared do you think you are for draft feeling pretty good overall i actually haven't drafted much in the last week or so i'm hoping to get i think we're going to be doing some reps there on the thursday before so gonna kind of have to brush up on things but but overall i've been feeling pretty confident with the format just it'll be good to draft it a couple times before jumping into the pro tour again just to make sure everything's fresh how has your week been, Jay? My week, I I just played the skirmish, my local skirmish this weekend. It was the sealed one. There was, what, 12, 13 players in it. Uh, ended up top eighting for the top eight draft. And then on my first round, I got destroyed by a Katsu with... I don't know how many Bonds of Ancestry he had in his deck, but on his <laughs> first turn going second, he uh, red surging, red descendant, red Bonds. Then on his second turn, he went yellow surging, yellow descendant, red bonds. And um, if uh, you guys played this limited format at all, you know that's unwinnable. So, yep. Yeah. Oh, but during the draft portion, I did open Plague Hive. So I do have one copy of that now, which is amazing. Nice. So even though you didn't win the draft top eight, you still kind of won. Oh, and uh, I won the raffle for the uh, Cold Foil Azalea. Jay just has the most important skill here is just getting lucky and opening sweet cards and winning raffles. Who needs to win the event if you just open and win raffles that are worth more than first place? Yeah, exactly. Just nah. oh, <laughs> oh, you know another card I opened during the sealed portion? I opened Codex of Frailty. Uh, you also opened the Marvel Codex of Inertia pre-release too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah, Jay's luck this set has been... Uh, Pretty good, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I've also opened a legendary piece of equipment during draft as well. Red Back Shroud? That was a good one, too. Must be nice. I actually yeah. have yet to open an L in this set, but I did open a Cold Foil Nerve Scalpel at pre-release, so not too bad. That that one that one's okay. That one's okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Not, not as good as Jay, but, you know, we do what we can. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, let's move on to our main topic here. So we're going to be talking about the Assassin class today, and let's, um, where do you want to start off with, Yugi? I think maybe a good starting point is that um, I think everybody knows that Assassin has the deepest card pool. They use generics very, very well. A lot of their commons block for three, and they just have a lot of flexibility about what can go into the deck. And I think everybody is pretty familiar with this because of um, Sealed, where Azuri is the most prominent hero by far, um, and Arachne is also pretty good. And you often end up playing kind of those Azuri piles where you are playing like 35-ish cards, and then that's kind of your main game plan is to just kind of wear people down 
identify fatigue. Do you think that assassin plays the same way in draft or are there are some differences? I think there is a little bit of a difference, but I think specifically Azuri, it plays quite similar on the kind of cards you want to be playing. So basically any stealth cards and and the two cost um the two cost attack actions. But I feel like in draft you end up playing like a more tight deck it's like a more like a 31 card or maybe 30 card deck that has just like that does everything a little bit better than in sealed yeah i think i would agree with that that i'm usually not really looking to play above 30 cards are there specific matchups where you would consider boarding up oh Let's yeah say for azuri especially azuri especially or actually even arachne i would i'll board up against the rangers um if you run out of cards against ranger it's a little bit um embarrassing and um if it's specifically Riptide, they will fatigue you out if you play exactly 30. So even if it's just like some mediocre two blocks, I would just add some of those in. Most yellows end up being a a spider's bite swing, so you can put those in as well. So I feel like just boarding up to like 33, 34 cards against uh, the Rangers is a pretty good, pretty good thing to do in general. Yeah, I haven't played a ton of Assassin in this format, but I've also not felt like I really needed to. Um, I feel like I pretty much understand how they work. And yeah, I think I agree with you that I don't really see a lot of reasons to go significantly significantly above 30 except versus Riptide, um, where you might want to board up to that like kind of 34-ish range. Yeah, and then if you do, then Riptide has just like a struggling time to like push damage through and and like either... like. They, they have a tough time killing you because you have so many three blocks, and they have a tough time fatiguing you because you have so many cards in deck. So it becomes a... Sometimes like that matchup becomes like unwinnable for Riptide, depending on like the power level of the decks. Yeah, I think I agree with all that. Okay, um, I think that Azuri and Arachne actually want... Some, of the, some similar cards, but also some differences in what they want as well. I think that they are pretty divergent in their play styles and and like you know most of the deck is going to be the same but there is some differences in terms of what you're prioritizing let's kind of talk up first about those cards that they both want and then we can talk about some of the differences between them let's start off with the generics then the first card on our list says two cost red attacks so these cards are going to be like cut down to size red destructive deliberation red wreck havoc red why are these cards good well, the obvious reason is um, obviously in Azuri, you can swap into them uh, using her attack reaction ability where you swap a stealth card for a card in hand. And when you're doing that, you just want the biggest attack possible. And because Azuri doesn't have a lot of ways to get go again outside of her spider's bites, um, you kind of want the one attack you do do to be as big as possible. So usually these all of these red big attacks are just kind of like good numbers and a lot of them also have relevant on hits too i think all the ones you mentioned cut down to size destructive deliberation and humble is a very good card in the format too turning off the hero ability can be pretty relevant um so i just think you want like those red red attacks that are good on stats and potentially have on hits Let's just keep on going down on this. We have the one cost attacks next, which is uh, looking for a scraps, spring load, and free reeling renegades. I think this is pretty obvious and why these cards are good. Um, looking for a scraps specifically good in assassin, just because the um, assassin class cards, the blue blue ones, block for three and is a one power attack action. So then looking for a scrap gets turned on very easily. But the spring load and free reeling renegade. Both are pretty good in Assassin because you get to pitch a blue and attack with your Spider's Bite and then have one resources remaining to attack with to attack with Spring Road or Free Reeling Renegades. Uh, I see I say it's free free reeling renegades again, but um I do need to specifically mention the blue one is pretty bad. The yellow one is is okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the and the red one is the one that you need here. But the spring load, the yellow and the red, I think, are both pretty decent yeah i think i agree with all of that the the yellow one's a lot worse because if they block with a three block you don't usually get to chip them although if they have like a two block attack and you spiders bited them 
still pretty decent. So it's playable, but it's not really where you want to be. I think another thing to look out for these is the if you have the, what is that card called? Threadbare Tunic, and you end up arsenaling one of these, you can kind of block out and play one off of the Threadbare Tunic. And that's also a really solid kind of one card hand coming in for five or, or for six that is sort of like a four, but forces them to block. Yeah, well, that can be done in every class, right? It can. I feel like, huh. I feel like it comes up more in Assassin. Why is that? I guess maybe because Assassin tends, especially Azuri, tends to lean a little bit more defensively and you have like better blocking values on your cards. So I feel like you're like more likely to want to block, to block out. Whereas I feel like Ninja, like the Kadachis are so good that you're probably keeping like a blue two block zero cost to Kadachi Kadachi play one. Mm, that's fair. That's fair. So yeah, I, I guess I do agree with you on that one. It's it's Spreadbear Tunic is probably the most useful in Assassin. I think it's uh, quite hard to use in Ranger until you get to like the end of your pitch stack, and then in Ninja, you typically just need like a zero cost. Uh, so it's just harder to empty your hand in that deck. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. And the last card on the list that's good in both decks is a card called Fleetfoot Sandals. I do say this is good, but I would not pick this card highly. This card is going to be very important in when we talk about a card later it's called Sneak Attack. I think, um, I guess we'll talk about the interaction when we actually talk about Sneak Attack then. We'll say it now since you've mentioned Fleetfoot Sandals. You may as well explain how it works. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So... There's an assassin rare called Sneak Attack. So Sneak Attack reads, if you've played or activated an attack reaction in this chain link, Sneak Attack gets plus four. And the red one attacks for three, yellow one attacks for two, and the blue one attacks for one. What's important here is, I guess the most obvious one is the blue Sneak Attack. If you attack from your hand without activating a Zuri activation, it will attack for one, which means you can activate Fleet Foot Sandals during your reaction step, which will then buff this card to plus four and give it go again. So a two for five go again is pretty good. It's like a surging strike red, essentially. The main thing here, though, that I do want to talk about is the um, with the play pattern with sneak attack red and sneak attack yellow in, let's say, Arachne. So typically sneak attack red will only hit for three, and it's very hard to activate sneak attacks plus four ability in arachne specifically because razor's edge says it needs to target a stealth card spike with below needs to target a stealth card and i don't think there's any attack reaction card you can play on sneak attack ready is there no because short and sharp also requires base power two or less so short and sharp will work on yellow and blue but it won't work on the red one um so your only ways are with the hat, there's there's a helmet that is an attack reaction, and then there's also fleet foot sandals. And how are you getting around the the target? Like the obviously the red one doesn't have one or less base attack. So how are you using fleet foot sandals in conjunction with this card? So fleet foot sandal reads attack reaction, destroy fleet foot sandals, target attack with one or less base power, gains go again. This card does not have to target the current card that's on the chain link so when you attack with sneak attack if you have attack with the most common card here would be spider's bite which has one base power you can actually activate fleet foot sandals to try and give the spider's bite go again during the sneak attack attack which will then give sneak attack plus four This card won't have go again, but it will get the sneaky plus four damage here. That's just face up on the board where, honestly, if you get this off against somebody, like, this could, this could, like, sneak wins in if, uh, if your opponent isn't aware of this. Yeah, it's not super intuitive. It doesn't usually come up that you would want to target, um, something on a previous chain link with the attack reaction because you don't really get any effect out of it, but because sneak attack doesn't it doesn't need an attack reaction to target it. It just needs something to be targeted while it's on the chain link. There's this interesting interaction, and it's something definitely to keep an eye out for. And there's going to be one more situation you can actually use Fleet Foot Sandals, which I haven't come up across yet because I'm typically trying to set up the the one power attack before the sneak attack. But what could happen is 
if your opponent blocks with a card with power one or less base power, you can actually still use Fleetfoot Sandals and target their attack and give it go again. And your fleet, uh, your sneak attack would gain plus four still, even if you don't have the one power, one power attack in your own combat chain. Does that work? I'm actually not sure if that one works. Yeah, it's a target attack with power one or less. So as long mm-hmm. as the card that is being defended is defended with is a one power attack, it would work. So okay, if you can get some, if you get somebody at the pro tour, being it's. Like 85% or 90% of the time, it's going to be a judge call because your opponent's not going to see it. They're going to block for three with like a wither blue, and then you can go fleet foot sandals your wither, give it plus four. <laughs> okay, well, now I know. Yeah, I was aware of the first one, but I wasn't aware of this one. Um, I guess before we move on from fleet foot sandals, the other place that it's quite nice is in Azuri in your end games, if they're starting to have to think about blocking your blue stealth cards like maybe you're on second cycle and they're low and they have to block your blue stealth cards to respect the um the big attack you can just give your blue stealth card go again and then attack them with something else and and then they've kind of like wasted a block on the one power card so not as sneaky but just like another reason that it can be solid in the deck yeah forcing your opponent to use two cards on a one power attack and then attack with just a card from hand is pretty gross honestly yeah, you just go like st- stealth attack for one, give it go again, cut down to size, and you're like, huh, it's not very good for me. Especially if you block the stealth attack for one with two cards. So something to be aware of, I think, if you're playing as or against Azuri. Yeah, the gross part about that is like, if your opponent just doesn't respect it and block for like two or something, and if you just sneak in the sneak attack, or if you just sneak in the cut down to size, you'll get four damage in. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of putting them in, in a spot where no matter what they do, they don't have good options. Yeah, and chess terms, you fork them. Yes. Okay. Yeah, let's just move on to the uh, Assassin Hybrid cards. Uh, this will include the Assassin Ranger and the Assassin Ninja cards. Let's talk about the Assassin Ranger stuff first. The top card on our list is Death Touch. It's good. Play it. It's above rate. We kind of talked about it in Ranger. Six for one is ridiculously good. It works with Tunic. You can Azuri this in, and obviously the on hit. We've been talking about how good Frailty and Blood Rot is, and having the choice between Frailty and Blood Rot is even better than just Frailty or Blood Rot. So yeah, Death Touch is probably one of the best cards in the set, and I'm very happy with red and yellow, and I still think blue is pretty good, although not quite as high of a pick. It does block two, and it does have to be arsenaled. Yeah, yeah. Just card's good. Pick it play it, hit them, and they complain. <laughs> yeah, I think this is on everyone's radar, so we can kind of move along. Then uh, the next cards would be the Assassin Ranger Trap. So Blood Rod Trap, Frailty Trap, Inertia Trap. We had a pretty long discussion on this on the Ranger episode, so if you do want to listen to that uh, to that portion of the, of the podcast from last week, that will probably be pretty descriptive of everything... I wanted to say with this card. Uh, is there a specific one you want in Assassin? I kind of feel like Assassin is a little bit less picky. Like I think in Ranger, the in Riptide, the priority is being able to trigger the trap for Riptide's ability. Whereas in Assassin, I think it's like more about the defensive ability to have this defense reaction that you can, you know, park an arsenal and cover stuff up with. Um, I think that they all kind of have their role. Like the frailty trap is pretty good sometimes. Um it's like a profitable way to potentially block Kadachis or Spider's Bite, or like a reasonable way to block Kadachis or Spider's Bite. And um, it's also just a, a D-React. Blood Rat, obviously really good against Azuri, but hard to make it work. And then Inertia can be kind of good against Ranger. Um, if Azalea like saves a card in hand and they pump up an arrow, not only does it stop damage, but you might just get their card. So I think that they're all pretty good, but I... I don't know. I don't really value any of them, especially higher than the others. How about you? Yeah, well, I'm in the same boat. It's a, it's a defense reaction that blocks for three. It's good. More block threes. Very good. Yeah. I think the big thing here is just use it when it makes sense to use it to block. And if it lines up and you trigger it, fantastic. But you're not nearly as incentivized to trigger it uh, for Azuri as you are for, for Riptide. Yeah, that's fair. And uh, moving on to the Assassin Ninja cards, 
uh, let's talk about Hurl first. So Hurl's the uh, the head jab with the additional with the additional cost that you may pay, and if you do you get to throw a dagger you control, and if it deals damage, uh, it's considered have hit. Yeah. So notably, this works with the spider's bite on hit, which makes it really good, especially in the end game. We mentioned that. There's kind of limited go again, especially in Azuri, and Hurl is a way to just get easy go again. Um, the red one's good because head jab's totally reasonable, but also the yellow and the blue one pitch for your spider's bites, and then second cycle can be just like they're good in, in Ninja for closing out the game because you get one free damage. They're even better at closing out the game in Assassin because you can get another um, debuff of the spider's bite. So So yeah. Really good in all pitches, honestly. And a card I wanted to talk about, and specifically the red color, Short and Sharp Red. This card has actually a lot of targets in Assassins um, for the attack action with two or less power. So it's going to be all of the yellow and the blue stealth cards uh, can get buffed. Mostly if they are have uh, on hits like Infect, uh, this card can go a long way. But mainly that this card can target one of your daggers and... Base, if you pitch a blue attack with Spider's Bite and Short and Sharp for one, it's just a clean two-card hand that hits for four. And as we said with Kodachis, like when your opponent attacks you with a weapon for one, it's really awkward to block it. And when you have like one copy of Short and Sharp Red in your deck, and if your opponent sees it or knows you have it, it's really hard to play around anyways. So it's like one of those attack reactions that are like, it's very good in like a lot of spots, and your opponent has like a really tough time playing around. So, I think this is like the first copy of the red short and sharp is a premium pick. I think having one just does a lot. Yeah, having one and not having one probably a big difference in your deck. Being able to buff the spider's bite is big. I think. Yeah, I agree. Okay, let's talk about some assassin cards that you want, and then we can kind of move on to some general stuff in the heroes. So for assassins cards. I think that they kind of want different cards to some degree, but what so a few cards that they both want is Razor's Edge. This is the zero cost attack reaction that can only target stealth cards. Just very good for pushing through on hits on your stealth attacks. And I think that the zero cost is pretty relevant. Sometimes the one cost on the spikes can can matter. So so I've actually really liked the the Razor's Edge, maybe even more than the spikes, but the the spikes are also very good and in particular Spike with Frailty and Spike with Blood Rod are the premium ones. Inertia is fine, but I think definitely worse than Razor's Edge. Yeah, I actually, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think Spike with Inertia is worse than Razor's Edge. The other thing that's good about Razor's Edge is an attack reaction, which means that it doesn't get debuffed by the Spider's Bite from your opponent. So it's just going to be like all three colors, it's going to be good as a three block. Yeah, pitch to daggers, sneak through on its in the light game. Very, very solid at every pitch. Sneak attack. So I think everybody's on this card as being a very good card in Azuri. You kind of mentioned that there's some tricks in Arachne with it. If you're drafting sneak attack, does that make you like, how does that affect your choice between the heroes? Are you, are you, if you're, if you're pretty sure you're Arachne, are you still picking sneak attack highly um, and trying to make it work? Or, or how are you kind of navigating that? It depends on where in the draft I am. When I, if I am already, know, if I already know I'm Arachne, it would depend on where in the draft I am to be able to pick sneak attack. But the first two copies of sneak attack will most likely make my deck as long as I have a way to turn it on. So, as I said, Fleet Foot Sandals or the Mask. Uh, I don't know what which mask it's called, but the attack reaction mask to turn on sneak attack. If I have one or both of those equipments, then I'm definitely picking taking up two sneak attacks. The only time I won't pick it up would be like if it's like really late in pack three and I don't have a attack reaction that can trigger the sneak attack, then I would actively avoid this card. Yeah, and I guess like specifically you're already Arachne, you don't have a, a deck that's going to be Azuri. Yeah, and if if I'm not sure if I'm Arachne or Azuri, I think sneak attack is a kind of card that would move me towards Azuri. But as I said, like if I have like multiple um, like Arachne cards already and... 
if I pick a sneak attack, then I'm just like actively looking for fleet foot sandals or the uh, mask with the attack reaction. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. What about fisticuffs? Do you count fisticuffs as a reasonable way to activate it? Uh, no, I do not count fisticuffs as a reasonable way <laughs> to activate it. I would count it as a option if it comes like... If push comes to shove, then yes, I would need to do it. But then finding four resources for sneak attack fisticuffs is very difficult. Whereas fleet foot sandals, you actually get the spider. You're, you're mostly attacking with the spider's bite. Like it is still four, but you still get an attack with the spider's bite. Whereas fisticuffs is like, it's like face up and it's not as good. So that's fair. Yeah, I think I, I, I think I think it's OK. I think I think if. I think if you already have a sneak attack and then you couldn't find a fleet foot sandals, the fisticuffs would be like option number three, which which is like still okay. Still okay. Yeah, just much worse. Yeah, and I agree. Fisticuffs just kind of doesn't work that well with the curve. You you can like, if you pitch a blue and sneak attack, you can threaten the threadbare tunic plus fisticuffs, but it's still a lot to invest. Um. <laughs> if you go pitch two blues, go spider's bite, spider's bite, sneak attack, Oh, no, that doesn't work with... You could do Spider's Bite Sneak Attack, Fisticuffs. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, you can't double. Okay, yeah. that's super face up, but you can do it. <laughs> it's super face up, but they also kind of have to respect it. Yeah, the red sneak attack just hits for eight, so they do they do need to respect it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think it's not terrible. There's there's lines you can take, and I think the tunic line is also a real line for the same, same reason. It's, it's very face up, but it's also just... If they don't do it, you cash in your thing, deal eight to them. If they do block, then you can just save your equipment. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Okay, uh, and the last card on the list is a uh, spike with X, which is frailty, inertia, and blood rot. Uh, we already mentioned this a little bit. Uh, spike with frailty is insanely good against the assassins and the ninja and the ranger. So everyone. Uh, and spike with blood rot is essentially just a one for five go again which is a premium in this set and this one blocks for three as well so honestly like one of the highest rate cards in the set and if you combine this with like infect they'll get two blood raw poxes or if you combine this with um wither they'll get a frailty and a blood raw and those are those turns are the most disgusting turns playing against uh assassins is when they when they spike with blood rot and on hit stealth card so these cards are just premiums and you should Pick them up highly if you see them. Yeah, I agree with all of that. Don't have a whole lot to add. Okay, blue count. How many blues are you running, let's say, in your Arachne lists? In my Arachne lists, I'm actually not that picky of how many blues I have. I'm more... Cons- I consider... I'm more worried about my red count in Arachne. So this will be the number of red stealth attacks uh, in particular, I want as many as possible in Arachne. And the blues end up being typically for Spider's Bite. So you don't actually need the blues in this deck, I don't think. I think yellows and yellows and reds are just much better. And the only time you want blues is like if you have multiple spike with blood rots or spike with frailties. So then you can do plays like Pitch of Blue, Spiders by Attack with Infect with 1-Up, so then you can go Spike with Frailty to go make it up to 6. But in general, I think I think like if you have like 5 or 6 blues, that's more than enough in Arachne. Yeah, I guess you're counting your yellows more as like also ways to pitch for Spiders Bites. Yeah, yeah. So like if I get like Yellow Infect, Yellow Wither, I think those are all like pretty decent and... It's not like you can have like a 20 red deck anyways, so... Yeah. And I'd be pretty happy with like a 20 red deck, honestly. (laughs) That makes sense. I I do think you want ways to activate your Spider's Bites because when you debuff their blocks and you make... Like suddenly it kind of makes like your infects into not really breakpoints, but kind of breakpoints because they're coming in for three and most of the three blocks are attacks. So it does make it harder to block. But um, yeah, I agree. Kind of pay attention to what else is in your deck. If you have spikes, you're going to want more blues. I think also if you have like spring loads or freewheeling renegades, you might also want blues because you can go something like Spider's Bite, Red Stealth Card, Freewheeling Renegade or Spring Load. But but yeah, I, I think you want reasons to include those blues rather than just by default searching out blues 
Yeah. I feel like Assassin is one of the hardest ones to be like giving you a definitive answer on how many blues, how many yellows type of things. Because it's very, as we said earlier, the pool in Assassin is quite large. So depending on which which portion of the Assassin pool you have really changes like what kind of cards you actually want to include in your deck. Whereas like the more Razor's Edges you have and like less costed cards... Like you just want like a straight red lion deck. And the more cut down a size and destructive deliberations you have, you want more blues and more ways to generate resources. Yeah, I think I agree with all all of that. So we've talked quite a bit about Assassin in general and kind of a little bit of what they're looking for. Let's d- dig into them each a little bit more. Arachne, you mentioned uh, the red stealth cards, and I think the reason why is pretty obvious. Arachne gives the first stealth card that you play go again and does have 19 life, so slightly more fragile, but um, this go again allows him to play very aggressively, threaten on hits that can be awkward to block, especially between like you have the spider's bite and then you also have the attack reactions and you kind of have this mix up of, do I have an attack reaction in hand to push my on hit like over Or am I just going to follow up with another stealth attack that might also threaten an on hit? And your opponent, it's it's, your opponent can't really reasonably block six on your first stealth attack. Like it's just not something that they can do. They can't really afford to play around because if they do that and you come in with like a spring load after, they're they're in a really bad spot. Yeah. Or and or if they do, then they just get to save the attack reaction for a later turn. Yeah, that's true as well. Even if they do have the attack reaction. So so really you kind of can't play around it unless you have defense reactions. And I think it makes Arachne like a pretty good aggressive deck. Okay. So I guess disclaimer, I've only actually drafted Arachne once. I've seen quite a few lists and I feel like I know exactly what it looks like and I've played a bit against Arachne a whole bunch, but I usually don't end up getting to draft it. I've found Assassin to be pretty heavily contested whenever I try to do it, even if I start with like an Infect or a Wither, which I think are some of the premium stealth cards The since they have the on hits, especially at red. Um, I've been finding it a little bit hard to get into, but... So so maybe I'll ask you more for your experience. Outside of those obvious, like those red stealth on hits, the Wither, the Infects, and Prowl is also another great card pushing your, pushing the, the Prowl gives your next stealth plus one. So if you come in with a Prowl, then you make your Wither or Infect come in for four. That's, um, that break point is, is really, really significant. But outside of those cards, what kind of, what kind of things are you looking for um, if you're trying to draft Arachne? Honestly, those are the cards you are looking for, and if you don't get enough copies of the of those exact cards you're talking about, in fact, Prowl and Wither at red, specifically at red, then your Arachne deck will start to they'll they'll start to like what's it called? How do I say it? Your your ceiling on your deck starts to fall very quickly in Arachne, but because of your hero ability giving any of your stealth card go again. Like, just having head jab for three that blocks for three is just, like, those are all just good numbers in general. Um, So, like, you aren't going to lose by a lot or win by a lot. And you're going to always have a close game. But the Arachne decks that do go over the top in 3-0 pods are the ones with, like, you know, three red infects, four red prowls, and two red withers. Um, with, like, two razor's edge to push you over the top. And... That's really what you're looking for when you are trying to get into Arachne. Um, recently, I feel like Arachne has been heavily contested, so I haven't been able to move into it as well. But when I do find multiple red prowls, it's probably my biggest signs to like move into Arachne. Yeah, I think I agree. And I think that the yellow prowls are also pretty reasonable so long as you have the, if you have the red withers and infects, because the yellow prowls still kind of like a red hat jab arguably a little better it comes in for two and then it pushes your on hit to a break point of four so it's still three points overall but the break point is probably a little bit better than that so obviously red prowl is even better but the yellow one is pretty serviceable and even the blue one's okay resource card that can sometimes be relevant yeah and to know all the stealth cards all block for three so even that alone makes them already playable so like 
all the colors on all the stealth cards are fine. It's just that which ones are specifically better in Arachne is like a a sign that you do need to know to to correctly assess that I want to be an Arachne deck or I want to be an Azuri deck. And I think Red Prowl, Red Infect, Red Wither, and multiple copies of that really push you towards Arachne. Yeah, agree with all of that. And then finally, I think the other, the last piece that we already talked about a little bit is the attack reactions, specifically the Razor Reflex and Spike spike with Blood Rot or Frailty, maybe a Red Short and Sharp in there as well. How many attack reactions are you wanting in Arachne? And do you feel like, do you feel like this is more of a nice to have or do you feel like Arachne needs some number of these? I think I'll answer the second question first. I think you need to have some of these cards for Arachne to really go over the top because if your opponent just keeps blocking out your on hits and ignoring all your non on hits, then you can fall behind pretty quickly. And and then the next question would be how many attack reactions do you need? I would like four red attack reactions and then any number of yellow and blue ones to like to pad out the to pad out the deck. But I feel like you need about four red attack reactions for your deck to be like the three O version of Arachne. So kind of like four red attack reactions as a minimum, you'd say? Maybe not a minimum, but like three minimum, four is yeah. like a good number to hit. I think I agree. And I, I've had the same experience that if both playing as and against Arachne, if you don't have the attack reactions, you're kind of just playing a bunch of head jabs. And even if you have an above average number of red stealth cards, it's hard to get through. And you're just kind of very predictable. So you need some of these attack reactions. And I think that it's in combination with the red stealth cards, really, really important to have. I think it's worth noting you can have too many attack reactions because at some point you'll start dra- you'll start drawing just all attack reaction hands and no stealth cards. So especially the attack like because most of the stealth uh, sorry because most of the attack reactions want stealth cards as targets, you don't really want to like overdo it on the attack reactions. I would say like, I'm probably happy with like six, seven. I think if you start going up to the like 10 plus, especially if they're reds, you can start running out of threats and drawing these like really attack reaction heavy hands. And I have actually seen this happen to people before. Yeah, if you ever draw like three attack reactions and and no stealth attack, you're you're in this awkward spot where you go like, spiders bite, spiders bite, do nothing else. And if you ever have that kind of turn, that's um, that's a disaster. Like you can easily lose a lose a game off of that one turn. Last thing on Arachne before we move on, I think the main playstyle that you're going to be doing is um, you're going to be weaving your spider's bites in between your stealth attacks, and it kind of depends on like where you're presenting the on hit. So if you're coming in with a prowl and you know that you have like a infect coming after you probably want to come in with a prowl come in with a spider's bite so that they're debuffed and then come in with the infect afterwards and if you're doing two spider's bites you probably want a spider's bite between each of your stealth attacks but usually you don't want to like double spider's bite because then you're just incentivizing your opponent to block and then they can just to block the second attack and then they can just simply put a three block in front of your a stealth card, which is not where you want to be. So if you have the resources to Spider's Bite or you have the extra cards in hand, it's it's quite good to do, especially with on hits. But make sure you're kind of thinking about weaving it in and trying to make sure you have one Spider's Bite active before uh, before an on hit, if you can. Attacking with a Spider's Bite without your stealth cards having on hits is, uh, is not that great because then they just get to ignore it. And like if you go Spider's Bite, uh, isolate Spider's like. Yeah, spiders bite isolate is like not as not as threatening to your opponent as like spiders bite wither. So just just be aware of like when you are planning out your turn that um maybe the card is better used as a block than to spiders bite, and just getting three points of block might be better than than just spiders biting. So I, I see a couple of people make that mistake of like keeping a card in hand and then using that to spiders bite. But then the debuff doesn't really do anything against against the card that they're attacking with next. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's that's Arachne. I think Arachne, when you get the 
good version is actually very powerful. Um, when you start pushing, like kind of Jay was mentioning, if you're doing like giving multiple blood rots a turn as a surprise, it's just a lot of damage. And because of the go again, it makes it really hard to predict and hard to accurately block outside of having D reacts. So I think Arachne is quite powerful when he comes together. But yeah, like Jay said, you want your like three to four red attack reactions, maybe play up to like five. And then as many red stealth attacks as you can get, any minimum red number of kind of those premium red stealth attacks that you're hoping to have. I think like seven. I think seven will be a good number. Prowl, like Prowl with their infect reds. If you have seven total, like two of each. Plus, uh, two of each will probably be good. Six, six minimum. Yeah, let's go six minimum. Yeah. Uh, and then if I have less than six, then I am like maybe leaning towards Azuri because then that means like we'll talk about Azuri in a little bit. Uh, so we can go into that next then. Yeah, that's that's a great point to kind of transition over to Azuri, I think. So um, Azuri, 20 life. And of course, um, her hero ability lets her activate an attack reaction that swaps um, so you put your stealth card on the bottom of your deck, and you put the card of your choice onto the combat chain uh, attacking. You don't get any of the attacking triggers, notably. So for example, spring load says when it attacks, if your hand's empty, you get plus three. It won't see the when it attacks trigger. Um, I think most people are aware of this, but just just in case. Oh, well, there's another important one, which is a ravenous rabble. So ravenous rabble says when it attacks, you reveal the top card. Uh, rabble does not look at the... Um, does not see when it attacks, so it will hit for the raw number that's on the bottom left-hand corner. So the red one will hit for five if you sneak that one in. Yeah, and this is actually a pretty good mix-up because they're not usually expecting you to go wide, but you definitely can. And five for two cards with go again is pretty okay. It's a surging strike. This is like enlightened strike with go again. Oh, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. I, like, like Enlightened Strike is obviously much better because it blocks for three and it has the modality to it, but like you, you E strike for five with go again and it's fine. So like it, it's pretty reasonable, specifically the red rapple, I think is pretty reasonable. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, that that is that is pretty good. Play style wise, what is the difference here with Azuri compared to we mentioned Arachne being quite aggressive, having these mix-ups and kind of pressuring breakpoints and on hits. What is Azuri's game plan? Azuri's game plan is to mainly threaten her hero ability, if you have it or not, to just always be presenting that that threat of activation and basically making your opponent not respect, but at least think about that option. And each time they make the wrong decision, that's when you... Obviously, they have no way of knowing which one the wrong decision is. But if you can keep on presenting 50-50s to your opponent, and if your opponent makes the wrong 50-50, then that's how you get your main edge from Missouri. But I think overall, she's going to be a defensive deck where you're going to be blocking with two cards in your hand, attacking with a stealth card, and then asking them, are you going to overblock this? Or are you going to no-block this? Or... Um, if you no block it, then I may come in with like a cut down to size that will rip a card out of your hand anyways. Um, if you over block it, then maybe it's just a, a one of like another stealth card in hand where I was already going to arsenal it anyways, and then you, you fall behind that way. Um, or you block for like just a three, and then they come in with like a wreck havoc or a humble and have an on hit anyways. So there's there's just like this like mini game of like which card are they gonna sneak in and which card they're not gonna sneak in. And you just will almost will never know what the right choice is. And that's where Azuri's main edge comes from. Yeah. And often this is sort of like um this often ends up equating to card advantage over the course of the game because if your opponent decides like maybe their hand's not that great and they don't know if you have it, but they can't really get value out of their cards. So they're just incentivized to block six. And then you just get an arsenal. Let's say you did have the threat and you get to arsenal your cut down to size. Well, you've traded your random stealth card that could be any pitch for two cards in their deck, which is good fatigue math. And you've still preserved that red threat as well. So you've gone up both in terms of cards in deck and in terms of card advantage because you've 
traded one card for for two cards. Um, you didn't even have to pitch a card to play the stealth card. So usually Azuri kind of gets ahead in terms of like value and fatigue by doing this. And um, I think that's kind of like where what, what makes her tick and what makes her pull ahead. I think the the last kind of mix up that she had, you mentioned a lot of the key ones, is uh, virulent touch at any pitch can be devastating, especially in the late game. Because if they've defended when it resolves, notably virulent touch doesn't say like when it's attacking. It says when the chain link resolves, uh, if they've defended with a card from hand, they get a blood rot. And if they're in a late game scenario where like they block six on something and then you swap this in and they get a blood rot, it is very, very brutal. And if they, you know, sometimes they don't block, you just hit with your stealth attack and you can arsenal virulent touch and then then it's in the spot it needs to be to play it from arsenal. So another pretty solid card, I think, in Azuri. Yeah. You want to quickly talk about some of the cards that are just like really good to swap in? Yeah. Yeah, I think we already talked about Ravenous Rabble and Verlin Touch. Uh, any other notable cards you want to like sneak in with uh, Azuri? So as the name would suggest, Sneak Attack is very good. Um, comes in for 6 at yellow, 7 at red. Uh, Gore Belching is a Majestic, but also a good one. Comes in for 7. And notably, you can just kind of play it. Like Especially if it's second cycle, you might just hit like a blue stealth card and it's just a 0 for 6, which is pretty good. So Gore Belching is like, even though it doesn't block, I think it's actively pretty good in Azuri. Um, I should say actively very good. Uh, cut Down to Size we talked about, Wreck Havoc we talked about, and of course, we mentioned Death Touch. Death Touch is good on rate, but um, sneaking in Death Touch is a little bit gross. And it sort of has the same thing going for it as Virulent Touch, where if they don't block it, or sorry, if they if they over block it and you're not going to get your on hit with Death Touch, you just get to Arsenal it. And then your next turn, you can Spider's Bite Death Touch for six with an on hit and your opponent's going to be very unhappy. <laughs> hmm, yeah, very true. Let's talk about Isolate. As we're, we're talking about all the cards that we can sneak in, what makes it better in Azuri uh, than just sneaking in these cards is the existence of a card called Isolate. And this is just a stealth card with Dominate. Very simple. But this basically means that because Azuri's uh, ability is an attack reaction, the opponent will have to, can only block with one card in their hand. And then if you sneak in any card, that card basically had Dominate during the block step. So you can give pseudo Dominate to all of your two cost cards, which is um, pretty insane, honestly. Yeah, the nice thing here is that it's risky for your opponent to no block it, because if you cut down to size, you get the insane value. But if they three block and you're presenting another on hit, like you have destructive deliberation to get the ponder, or you have death touch to give them a blood rot or a frailty token, like it's just such a beating because you blocked and you still didn't cover it up. And you kind of just like, you just kind of feel like you don't have a good option. And I think in Azuri, you actively want a bunch of isolates. Like I'd be happy playing five or six. The color doesn't really matter at all. Yeah, the colors doesn't really matter that much. You can just play them and you can still activate Azuri's ability. So any color isolates, very good. Yeah, yeah. Like honestly, like a mix of them is pretty sweet for the late game because you'll need the blue ones to pitch for Spider's Bite. The red one just attacking for three is pretty annoying in some spots. Just they're all good and they're all good in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, a big telltale sign should be that you know, I don't think Azuri is the best deck in Classic Constructed right now, unfortunately. I think she's close. But um, most of the Azuri lists out there are, at least if they're playing like, a, if, if they're not doing like the Arachne contract thing, um, most of the Azuri lists out there are playing nine isolates of all the pitches. So usually when you see cards like that, that are really, really good and seeing nine ofs in Constructed, you should also be drafting them highly. That's fair. Anything else you want to talk about, Azuri? I think the last one is that because outside of Ravenous Rabble and then some rares like Hurl and what's the other one? Looking for a Scrap, which are very good in Azuri, by the way, uh, super premium. Because outside of those, you don't really have very good ways to use big hands. So you're really wanting to be able to defend well to make up kind of the rest of the value out of your hand. Like if if most of your play patterns is spider's bite, stealth card, 
sneak something in or just stealth card, sneak something in and no spiders bite, um, you're playing like two to three card hands and you really want to be making sure that you have good defensive options. So that can mean three blocks. And that can also mean uh, cards like Red Peace of Mind, uh, especially when paired with the Seeker's equipment. I think if you have kind of what, like we mentioned, one Red Peace of Mind per Seeker's equipment is very good. And the defense reactions, I think, are still solid in Arachne, but I've especially liked them in Azuri because you get to do the thing of play a stealth card. I'm holding like a red piece of mind or a, or a defense reaction or a trap. And your opponent still has to play the mini game of like, do I block this? Do I respect the on hit? Maybe it's just like a blue stealth card that doesn't do much. And then you never were planning to swap anything in anyways. You're just planning to arsenal the defense reaction. Um, so I think that having these defensive tools really helps Azuri get good value out of her hands and also uh, kind of leans into that longer game plan where she kind of grinds out the opponent and prolongs the game. I think it's pretty important. Like if you're against Azalea, you need some ways to stop dominate or the game can get hard for you. Yeah, just being able to play defense reaction from Arsenal as Azuri is just pretty powerful. Sometimes like if you end up arsenaling like a two cost card in your arsenal, it can get like awkwardly stuck in there for like an extended period of time. And if you just have like a defense reaction they can block with, it just makes it that much easier to like use your hand more efficiently. I guess the big differentiators between Azuri and Arachne, they both want stealth cards. Arachne really wants reds, and especially Wither Infect Prowl. Azuri wanting pretty much any color, like the Infect. Uh, Prowl is not great. Infect and Wither are pretty good. And then Isolate is the best one in Azuri. So a little bit of a difference in what which ones they want. And then I think Arachne really wants the attack reactions, whereas Azuri really wants the uh, the big attacks and the defense reactions. And, and again, that doesn't mean that like you can't play the attack reactions in your Azuri deck. Spike with Blood Rod is still like still very good in Azuri. You can still, still play Still a one it. for five. Still a one for five. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can still kind of do the same thing of, like, you think about it, you do, like, your Spider's Bite come in with my um, stealth card, and you're still making them play the mini game, uh, and then you just spike with Blood Rod, and if it's on a if it's on a red stealth card that's six power, it's, it's, like, it's like a death touch, sort of, like, in, in terms of output. So um, you can still play those cards, but I think just a little bit of a different priority. The attack reactions are good, but not required. Whereas Azuri really wants the defensive tools, which are fine in Arachne, but you probably don't want to go overboard with d in Arachne because he is more aggressive. Uh, one thing that I wanted to just mention about playing against Azuri, I got got by this last Monday. Last Monday? No, last Thursday. Sorry, last Thursday. If your opponent activates Azuri, and if you already have a defense reaction in Arsenal, think about maybe just like playing that defense reaction from Arsenal before you see what card gets sneaked in i got killed by wreck havoc which reads a uh, defense reaction can't be played and then pops the um the card in arsenal uh if it hits but while wreck havoc is face down uh with azuri's ability you can you have a window to play all of your defense reactions and you can just play the defense reaction before the wreck havoc becomes face up and it just might be like a good habit to get into of just like just in case it's a wreck havoc you don't immediately blow up and lose yeah and that's specifically if the d reacts in arsenal but also if um i don't know maybe you're riptide and you have multiple traps in hand and you can't use them all um like you 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 like you you don't have a use to like pitch one and arsenal one or something like that. You kind of need to get it out of your hand, and you're really relying on blocking with that card to get value. You should probably just do it before the uh, Azuri attack reaction. Yeah, the one in hand is like a little bit less important, just because like then you can pitch it or like there's some ways to do something with it. But when your your defense reaction in your arsenal and gets blown up, you, that is. Un, like that that basically turns your game into like a one unwinnable state if your opponent is playing close to perfect yeah i i agree if it's if it's from arsenal you definitely want to play it from hand i think if you have multiples and you're relying on blocking out of that card you should play it but yeah but otherwise yeah. you're probably okay yeah yeah so, or um there's the awkward moment as you do that and then your opponent like puts in like 
<laughs> some some dinky four power attack and you're just like oh i accidentally overblocked it yeah <laughs> that sure. happened to me once <laughs> also on the note of wreck havoc there's this like it's kind of funny against ranger because it can potentially <laughs> remove their ability to put an aim counter on an arrow if it's in arsenal and it can also like because it flips the card face up and it just stays face up so you can't flip it anymore oh that's it also, so sick it also, yeah, it also notably flips up spire sniping. So if you're if you're playing Azalea and you have a spire sniping in your arsenal and there's a wreck havoc, like you just get to flip that up for free, which is pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty funny. That's like edge cases for with wreck havoc, but it is uh, it's it's something that can happen actually pretty commonly because it's a rare and a common. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So pretty minor, but just since we're on the topic, may as well mention it. Oh, actually, one more thing that I found out, uh, not found out, but what just happened to me, I just played a draft with uh, the Savage Land group again. Uh, I'm going to post up the draft and the um, the gameplay videos a little bit later. But I ended up attacking with Wreck Havoc, and it hit. And the card that got flipped face up was a Bleed Out Red, and I'm playing as a ninja. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm blocking Kodachi's this turn. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. The information can be useful. I guess if you saw like an attack reaction. Attack reactions are a little bit awkward though, because like yeah. if you overblock, then then they don't have to use it and It's true. Yeah, yeah it's kinda of like how like I think about like playing Lexi and you have the lightning press up in Arsenal. It's almost it's almost just better because like your opponent <laughs> has to try and play around it, but they just can't. <laughs> impossible. In impossible. That card is broken. Lightning press should be banned in in limited. <laughs> very relevant to our outsiders draft discussion <laughs> all right anything else about um assassin and outsiders before we wrap up oh uh, no it's like honestly like assassin is a pretty simple play good three blocks play good cards play good on rate cards like, it's like that kind of deck so it's not as complicated. It's probably the most simple deck to play in Outsiders, which is why so many people end up drafting it. And it's like also like the deepest card pool. So there's just like a lot of different ways to play it. So it's like the safest deck to like land on if you aren't too familiar with this format. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I think it's also a pretty good safety valve, much in the way that Phi and what is the set called? Uprising was kind of like, if you were going to pivot to something because you're getting cut, you probably pivot to Phi just because medium Phi is pretty good and he has a deep card pool. Kind of the same thing as an operation here with, with Assassin. And I think the hybrid cards also help emphasize this, but usually I'm pivoting from, if I'm, if I'm starting Ranger or Ninja and pivoting off of it, usually Assassin is the place I land. It's not very common that you pivot from ninja into ranger yeah i don't you can also do assassin into either of them but you're you're usually not doing ninja into ranger specifically yeah i don't think you can actually move from ninja to ranger or ranger to ninja it's quite difficult honestly There's the cards that you want are like just so drastically different in those two decks but the uh assassin the assassin class really like holds these holds all the classes together essentially maybe last thing how many how many drafters at the table do you think Assassin supports kind of optimally? Like we kind of talked about Ninja and Ranger. You probably want to be the two. For Ninja, maybe you can be a three of and it can work out. And like maybe if the packs are like really heavy Ranger, obviously you can have three Rangers. But like yeah. usually you want to be the two of for Ninja and Ranger. What about Assassin? I think I think three. I think at three Assassin, your deck should be pretty good. And at four, your deck gets quite it can get quite rough because then maybe you're getting passed by an assassin and you're passing to an assassin, something like that. But definitely at three assassins on a table, you should have a pretty decent deck. Yeah, I think I agree with all that. And I think I think maybe the other thing about assassin at four is not only does your deck get worse, but that probably means that there's two ninjas and two rangers, assuming that people are drafting more or less correctly. There's probably two of each. It's not very common that there's one of uh, of a class but it, but it does happen but if you're against like their, their decks also get better because you know there's only two of each of them at the pod so i think if you end up in that four two two split the ninja and rangers are going to have a, a pretty good time against the assassins just because their decks are very good and the assassin decks are a little diluted mm -hmm, yeah but when you're the three assassin that means there's a three of ninja or three of rager and then those deck becomes 
quite mid. So it's 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 a nice balance, honestly. Of like, it's it's at a good point where it's like three and a half assassins, probably average two and a half mm-hmm. ninja, two and a half rangers. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with that, and I think most people are kind of uh, most people I've talked to or heard heard talk about the format are kind of on the same page here. But it it is it is good to note, and um, yeah, yeah, I think that's assassin. <laughs> Okay. Um, Thanks for listening. As always, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to us in the comments down below. We'd love to hear about your experiences drafting Assassin, or if you're going to Baltimore, what some of your plans are in Baltimore, maybe what you're looking forward to most um, when you're in Baltimore uh, this coming weekend. If you want to reach out to us on social media, Jay is at Ueda Jay on Twitter, and I'm at Yukili Bender. And you can also email us at onthebobble at gmail.com and send your questions directly there. That's going to wrap us up for today. Hope everyone has a great time in Baltimore and good luck to everyone competing and good luck on your assassin drafts if you find yourself there. Very, very quick. It's uh, about Baltimore. I'm a little sad I can't go. I'm not going because I'm not qualified to Baltimore. Uh, but the I think the event to play, if you are going to go there not playing for the Pro Tour, is make an Ultimate Pit Fight deck and play Ultimate Pit Fight. Or the other event that I would highly recommend is the uh, Shapeshifter Sealed event. That that event will be sick if they if they include outsiders as one of the packs in the Shapeshifter Sealed. Just remember that Spider's Bite Kodachi is a sick two weapon <laughs> uh, lineup that you can do. If you pitch any blue, you can go Spider's Bite and you can do Kodachi for one at the end. So just just keep in mind that that is a sick weapon lineup. Otherwise, you might just want to go with Romping Club if WTR is part of the packs. Wow. Spider's Bite, Kodachi. It's yeah. not something I had ever considered. <laughs> Look, I grind all the side events. Like, if I were to go to Baltimore, I wouldn't even play the calling. I would just grind side events. And these are important things to note. Or or 45-car pile Romping Clubs. That is also a good deck in Shapeshifter Sealed. So just keep those in mind. Yeah, it might even rival the uh, the Dorenthia Spider's Bite, Do- uh, not Spider's Bite, Kodachi Dawnblade setup. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can you Kodachi Dawnblade? Oh no, you can't. No, <sighs> Dawnblade's a two-handed weapon, yeah. It's uh, manable. It's, it's what you can do is if you if crucible is part of your packs and if you open manable claws, you can go manable kodachi. Ah, that's so much worse though. It's it's so much worse, and it's like significantly more difficult to open manable claw as one of your rares. Um, and another no. note for shapeshifter sealed: just opening one of the like the what's it called? Um, supplemental sets if you open a hero with more than 20 health that probably is the hero you should be playing <laughs> valda is very very powerful in shapeshifter sealed very nice i yeah. guess i guess two i guess two kodachis with dory would be pretty good you just get three kodachi swings <laughs> uh it ends up being not that good because Dory really wants like specific cards that have to do with weapons, and then like just playing regular cards three blocks is better. And then if you're doing that, then Romping Club ends up being pretty good. And like, Romping Club is like just a good card. And then you just want a hero fair. really that does something. Yeah, I guess you're doing four instead of uh, instead of three. one three times. Yeah. 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 Clearly, clearly, I'm a person that's thought about Shapeshifter sealed more than a regular person that should or have to. <laughs> yes, Jay is your go-to for all things Shapeshifter She's Sealed. I'm clearly a, a scrub here because I didn't even realize that you couldn't run Kodachi Dawnblade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Romping Club, good card. All your lo- yellows turns into fours. It's better than Titan's Fist. Remember <laughs> that. If you're a guardian, you should do Romping Club over Titan's Fist. Or mm, Anathos. Good. So much better. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Good luck, everyone in Baltimore, and uh, mainly have fun. Yeah, have fun. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>